This next panel, please, I'll have the panelists come out. Uh, it is focused on operational ice centers. And so, uh, Kevin, may I uh, ask you to sort of moderate, lead, introduce as we go? Commander Q, you already made the decision. That is a better decision than mine. Please take it away. All right. And let's see if this, and the video is not playing, of course. Oh, there. Oh. Ah, keep going. Okay, there we go. Nope. We'll get this going here in a second. Good morning, everyone. I'm Commander Kristen Staramgard, Commander of the International Ice Patrol, and I'm pleased to uh, be sitting up here with my colleagues from other operational ice centers, uh, Mr. Scott Weiss, the Operations Director from the Canadian Ice Service, and Mr. Kevin Burbridge, the Deputy Director of the U.S. National Ice Center. Today we'll be discussing, we'll each have about a five-minute presentation on our operational ice centers, and then that should leave us 10 to 15 minutes or until Mike gives us the hook for questions from the audience. So please don't be uh, intimidated by those microphones on the sides. So, uh, since uh, Rear Admiral Gallaudet says I have the coolest job, um, I'll start out this panel. Uh, the video that you're watching is of the drift and deterioration of the nearly 9,000 icebergs that the International Ice Patrol tracked this season from February until uh, July of this year. So the mission of the International Ice Patrol is to monitor and uh, warn mariners of the iceberg dangers on the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. Formed in response to the sinking of the, the RMS Titanic on April 15, 1912, formalized by IMO Solis and codified in US law, the International Ice Patrol has been doing this mission since 1913. We uh, ex execute this mission in this region in particular because it is currently the only region in the world where icebergs and transoceanic shipping lanes intersect. And I note that that is currently because as transpolar routes open up, and there's, I know there's some debate over that, but the increase of interaction potential for ship iceberg interaction increases. Uh, so the video you can see, or the image you can see, is of our ice reconnaissance region, and I particularly note the latitude of 48 degrees north. We particularly track this latitude. Um, when icebergs uh, drift below this latitude, they really start to impact transatlantic shipping. Vessels have to go off their great circle route, and in times of just-in-time shipping, um, larger cargoes, this can add 24 to 48 hours, depending upon where the iceberg limit is and, the, and where the vessels have to track. So how do we do our mission? This is our warning product that we generate. Um, we generate a daily, we generate a product both a, in a text format and a graphic format. And the International Ice Patrol does this from February until August, and in, from September to January, our colleagues at the Canadian Ice Service execute and produce the same product. We, uh, we've done that uh, coherent product since 2011, it helps for our mariners, so they see a consistent product regardless of which ice center is producing it. What you see here is an iceberg limit shown in pink, and inside that iceberg limit, a density distribution of icebergs per one degree latitude by one degree longitude. This shows the iceberg limit for two dates, April 15th, 1918, or 2018, and April 15th, 2019. And what you can see is the significant interannual variability from one year to the next. In 2018, the final resting place of Titanic is 250 nautical miles south of the iceberg limit. In 2019, she laid 60 nautical miles within the limit. The significant interannual variability can be seen in our entire 119-year data set um, across the, the time period, where we can see from some years we'll have no icebergs below 48 degrees north, and we'll have, some years we'll have upwards of over 2,000. Our biggest season was 1984 with over 2,200. This year, we've had one, over 1,500 icebergs cross south of 48 north. This has been our 10th most severe season on record. And that number is actually normalized based upon our reconnaissance methodology. Our data set can be divided into three main reconnaissance periods, ships, aircraft, and then aircraft fitted with radar coupled with computer modeling. 2017 marked the transition to our fourth reconnaissance period, and that is satellites. Now, why did it take until 2017 to I for Ice Patrol to start utilizing satellites? 
That's because our area on the Grand Banks of Newfoundland is persistently covered with clouds and fog. This renders sensors in the electro-optical and infrared spectrum, which can't see through water vapor, not operationally viable for our operational area. As such, we're required to rely on synthetic aperture radar satellites. These satellites and the commercially available were, not, uh, were cost prohibitive prior to 2016. In 2014 and 2016, the European Space Agency, under the Copernicus program, launched their Sentinel-1A and 1B satellites. Their free and open data sharing policy was a game changer for the International Ice Patrol. The significant hurdle of cost of purchasing satellite imagery over this significant vast expanse of IIP's AOR was, uh, was finally taken away. And we were able to invest into uh, analyzing how to use satellite imagery how to use this SAR imagery, and what does an iceberg look like in this SAR image. And you can all see that. Um, we, we started out doing some, trying to validate what we were seeing in satellite imagery. And what you see in the bottom, uh, your bottom right, is uh, an iceberg taken, a photo taken from our C-130 aerial reconnaissance, and that same iceberg in a synthetic aperture radar Sentinel-1 image. Um, the bottom left shows the increase in satellite imagery that uh, are satellite detections of icebergs at the Ice Patrol since 2016. And you'll notice a plateau from 2018 to 2019. And this is significant because our current processes for analyzing satellite imagery are still manu significantly manually intensive. We need to look to automation, especially with Sentinel, we have a six-day repeat coverage of our AOR. With the launch of Radar Canadian's RadarSat Constellation mission, we will have daily full coverage resolution of IIP's AOR. That's a whole lot of data coming at us. That's one big elephant. And we got to figure out how to eat that elephant. And the way to do that is through automation and machine learning. To make a smart machine, you need a lot of validated data set. And our validation attempts via aerial reconnaissance have yielded very limited results to date. As such, the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate is sponsoring this year a campaign to improve that machine learning data set. And they are doing this by deploying GPS trackers on board icebergs via drone delivery. So far, we've done three uh, deployment missions. We have deployed over 80 uh, GPS trackers. You can see one GPS tracker, uh, one deployment drone sitting on the deck of Juniper there. Uh, in the bottom right, you'll see a 57-meter iceberg that was tagged. And in that same day, about four hours later, a Sentinel uh, satellite passed over and imaged, and you can see the inset image. Now, do you see the iceberg in there? Right? It's really difficult. And in fact, we had five different agencies from three different nations blindly analyze this image. We knew where their iceberg was, and we knew that there was one in there. And none of the agencies got it correct. None of them. The resolution of Sentinel is 20 meter resolution. This was a 60 meter iceberg that nobody found. Right. So the other part of this mission is also very interesting. We're getting 3D profiling of the image of the icebergs. So you can see the, the final set of pictures there. That's a 180 meter waterline length iceberg. And then it's 3D profile. The yellow is the above water, and the blue is the below, below water profiling of that image. That data, along with the GPS tracking data, will be significant to advancing iceberg drift and deterioration modeling. So the Department of Homeland Security is not just one of our partners that we deal with to execute the Ice Patrol mission. We deal with several partners. It, it takes a, a, a big team to execute this international mission. But one of our biggest partnerships is that of the North American Ice Service and why I'm on stage with these gentlemen today. The North American, and we'll briefly talk about the North American Ice Service later, but that's a consortium of the Canadian Ice Service, the U.S. National Ice Center, and IIP as the core members. And then additionally, we have the Danish Meteorological Institute and the National Weather Service Alaska region as observers and, our, and participants. And our goal is to use the, uh, the, the uh, uh, efficiencies of each of the organizations to benefit and provide uh, a, a consistent suite of products across North American waters. And with that, I'll turn it over to my North American Ice Service colleague, Mr. Scott Weiss, to talk about the Canadian Ice Service. 
Thank you for the introduction. I appreciate it. Um, so yes, I am Scott Weiss. I am the manager of the forecast and analysis operations at the Canadian Ice Service. I've been in that role since January, so I'm fairly relatively fresh to that role. Um, but I've been with the Canadian Ice Service since 2012, so I've worked my way up through the ranks as a forecaster and a program manager. So have a fairly high degree level of comfort with uh, the program and our partnership as well too. As Kristen said, it's fundamental to the way we operate. It allows us to establish a collaborative and authoritative source of information for um, our overlaps and our AOIs. Um, so I'll go to my first slide. And uh, Canadian Ice Service, our mission really is to provide information about ice in Canada's navigable waters. So Canada's navigable waters are quite extensive, um, and we do show our uh, boundary overlaps with the Alaskan AOI, and also on the east coast of Canada as well too with the IIP, and also in the Great Lakes. So NACE helps us operate efficiently in all of those domains. Uh, as Kristen pointed out, we share the Iceberg program. Uh, we have complete uh, and coherent backup now, which is a really big accomplishment for our programs. Um, and with Nick, we share a long-range forecasting program. It's a 30-day forecast program that uh, we um, have run for many years, uh, and it's established in the Great Lakes and also in the Arctic as well, too. Um, we also do a little bit of daily forecast products that we share as well, too, with Nick, uh, the Great Lakes and the Bering Strait forecast, which are actually currently active and underway. So this is an excellent way for us to, to share knowledge and experience and also uh, produce a, a consistent north authoritative product for the area. I um, should say, too, at the bottom of that slide, too, go back. Um, we are a member also of the International Ice Chart Working Group. So that's a fairly large uh, group of uh, international partners that try to establish standards for ice charting. Um, we have annual meetings that work uh, to uh, synthesize the kind of work we're doing and uh, chart some future vision for where we're headed. Also, we are a, a participant on the expert team on sea ice. So this is a network of ex ice experts. So in this slide here, this just kind of uh, summarizes some of the major products that we offer at CIS. Uh, we do forecast ice charts, image analysis, iceberg analysis, ice hazard warnings. Uh, we do a lot of climatological work for analyses and uh, derived products as well too. Um, we have a satellite tracking and pollution program as well too. Um, we do dedicated mission support to industry and also to other government departments, including our national defense. Um, and then we also produce uh, something you see there, um, in the top left corner. It's the uh, uh, synthetic aperture radar mosaics and analyses as well too. So as Kristen pointed out, SAR data is our bread and butter. It is really drives a lot of our program. Um, from a client perspective, CIS is a service agreement with the Canadian Coast Guard. So that makes Canadian Coast Guard our primary client. So a lot of our work is directed to suit their endeavors and uh, help support their mission and work in the Arctic and the East Coast of Canada and the Great Lakes. Um, but we also do a lot of these products for public good. So a lot of the charting and uh, forecast and analysis that we do is in the public domain and available for industry, communities, and other stakeholders. We've also tried to do a little bit of work to tailor some of that to suit their needs as well too. So we're fairly interactive and, and open to discussion and uh, participation. Um, CIS is fairly large. Um, my work unit has about 30 employees, but we also have a couple other large uh, presences as well. We have a field services work unit. Field services, um, the, they're ice service specialists. They work as a liaison, typically between the Canadian Coast Guard and CIS operations. They provide briefing services, interpretation, and support, either from shore base offices or on icebreakers, actually. Uh, Canadian icebreakers, that is. Uh, we have a science section as well, too, in-house. Um, they provide support to operations via modeling, um, climatological work, and they also have a lot of expertise in image processing and manipulation, so very useful for operational endeavors as well, too. Um, something you see in the center of that graphic there, um, there's a black outline there, and those are our med area obligations. So med areas are an IMO and a World Meteorological or Organization initiative that coordinate the transmission of meteorological information to mariners through international and territorial waters. So it's a little bit outside of our um, domestic waters, but it's a, a way to provide at least a baseline of meteorological information, in this case, sea ice information, um, to uh, mariners and other active users. So this slide here is really outlining the challenges, and this is kind of, um, I guess, beating a, a, a very similar refrain to a lot of the other presentations we've seen over the last day and a half. Um, I'll focus primarily on the changing conditions in the Canadian Arctic, um, because this is really where our expertise is focused. 
Here is um, our Western Arctic regional domain. We have um, a weekly activity at CIS where we produce climatological analyses. It populates a database for the uh, Arctic, it goes back to 1968. For the Great Lakes, it goes back to 1972. So a very important source of climatological information. Here we have three different kind of ways to process and look at the information that is in that climatological repository. And the top right, that's what we call departure from normal ice concentration. So it's a 1981 to 2010 climatology it's compared against. So that's a bit of an issue too because it is a bit of a data climatology, but in 2020, 2021, we'll be updating that. But it gives you some perspective about how much change has been undergoing, especially here in the Western Arctic. So that's the Southern Beaufort Sea, you see. The red areas are illustrating where you have less ice cover than normal. And the blue would be where you'd have a little bit more than normal. This is fairly recent data, too. This is from early July. So I'm not trying to stack the deck to show you a particularly preferential situation to support my argument. This is just the reality of what we're in right now. Uh, you see extensive areas of red co uh, coverage, so very much uh, less ice cover than normal. Um, this has really been the trend uh, for many years now. Um, it's a very typical signal, and it will extend out through the whole melt season and continue to move farther northward in the Beaufort in particular as the ice recedes. Um, the bottom right graphic is what we call an old, a departure from normal of old ice or multi-year ice. Um, so what you can see there is that there's a two-part signal there. In the Beaufort, in general, you see a red area kind of in the southern to central portions of it where there's much less old ice than normal. So that really supports a lot of the discussions you've seen. Uh, so there's nothing really new to talk about there. What's really interesting, though, is the blue area. So that's more old ice than normal in those areas and locations. And the phenomena that's been uh, explained to me in this case is that a lot, especially in the archipelago, the central Canadian archipelago there in the islands, there are a lot of gates, fast ice, consolidated ice, that typically remains fasted and consolidated throughout the year and prevents the influx of Arctic Ocean multi-year ice into those areas. Those gates are fragmented and broken, and they are actually permitting the flow inwards of old ice into the Northwest Passage, as you can see. It makes navigation incredibly hazardous when you have old ice in those areas. So this navigability paradigm that we hear talk about more and more is faced by very concrete challenges in the boat uh, with old ice infusions in these kind of areas and these passages. So something to think about. It's a takeaway I think is very important in this uh, conversation. The last topic uh, I want to cover in this is the graphic there with the bar graphs in the top left. So that's just the, uh, the total ice, uh, accumulated ice coverage throughout the season. And that's for, again, that same domain that you see displayed in those uh, spatial graphics. And you can see a uh, declining trend over time. What we also do here is we separate the ice by stage of development or ice type. And what's important to note in that graphic is the brown is the multi-year old ice um, component. And you can see it's significantly trending downwards. It has interannual variability, which I think people have touched on as well too, which is important to remember. Uh, the last year, we see that kind of peaking coming back up again. It's because we're seeing an injection of the remaining old ice into the domain, which is supported by the bottom right graphic. So it, there are some subtleties and challenges to remember when you're operating in the Arctic. Um, so an evolving service. You can see that we're being fairly pushed by the changes in the climatological uh, regime there. So in response to these changes, we're trying to, uh, CIS, and CIS is a part of the Environment and Climate Change Canada, uh, a portion of the Meteorological Services Canada. We're really trying to improve our service and meet the needs of our many clients and end users. So as Kristen talked about, we talked about automated classification of icebergs. We're also doing some work as well on sea ice as well too, uh, due to detection and classification to improve workflows. Um, and efficiencies and broaden our coverages. Numerical modeling of sea ice. Um, ECCC has done a tremendous amount of work to improve the suite of operational models at shorter, medium, and even longer range timescales. Even as we speak this month, we've had a, a, a substantial improvement and increase in the amount of numerical data that's going to be offered to our operational environment. Um, RCM, so Radar Sat Constellation Mission, this is an absolute game changer, can't be underemphasized. It will provide complete and daily coverage of the Canadian Arctic and, uh, well, the Arctic in general. For my perspective, it's, a, it's Canadian, obviously, but it is going to absolutely fundamentally change the way that we look at delivering our business. And we're going to have to find ways to take in that data because, as Kristen said, this is going to be almost overwhelming. Um, as a meteorologist, by heart, <laughs> too much data is never a problem, but in this case, as a manager, it may be. So I'm going to have to shift that a little bit in my mind. Um, we've tried to help address a little bit more of the community focuses as well. The top center graphic is a, a way that we've tried to 
tailor some of our charts to do a little bit more community work, try to help out communities locally with transit and navigation between communities and, and help them uh, use our ice charts in a, in a tailored and targeted manner. And there's lots of work to do there yet, tons and tons and tons, so there's lots of outreach and work that's being done on that. And the other thing is uh, just about charting and opening and closing dates. So our season gets expanded longer and longer. Um, we used to have shoulder seasons. When I first came to CIS, it used to be a kind of downtime in the spring and the fall where you had time to collect your thoughts, do project work, advance program. Now it's pretty much running full steam throughout the year because you see the two charts on the right side there in Hudson Bay. Uh, a couple years ago, we didn't have to open a really wide, extensive areas because there was ice in northern Hudson Bay at the early part of the season, and it really kind of didn't allow the, the uh, active navigation. And this year, we've seen, again, there's, there's a lot of open water there for people to navigate. So ambition is becoming to become very present in a lot of operators to get there earlier, to do their jobs earlier. And we have to respond to that. It's, it's in our mandate, right? So uh, just my last slide here, just about the partnerships. So the partnerships are absolutely fundamental to the Canadian Ice Services uh, mandate and mission. So it's working with groups from IIP and from NIC that really make, um, make us be able to meet our goals and do it in a, in, a, in a way that works with my resources and my staff and complement. So we have a lot of shared products. You see with, um, with IIP, there's the, um, the iceberg chart that we do share production for and, and some bulletin work as well too that depict iceberg hazards. Um, and then with Nick, and it's a natural transition into Kevin's presentation here, that we have uh, shared work again in Bering, Great Lakes, and a lot of uh, uh, ice hazard uh, bolton production too. So thanks. All righty. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, just before I start, I think, you know, operational demand for, for ice products. Um, I've been uh, serving as the deputy director at the U.S. National Ice Center for, I'm going on my fourth year now, and that demand, whether it's increasing in volume, so more demands, more, uh, more requested products, uh, or uh, different types of demands, per se, that is uh, being experienced. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges of my job. But to kick things off, so I'm sitting here speaking for Heather Qualandorino. She serves as the U.S. National Ice Center um, uh, Director. Uh, she's also the Commanding Officer of the Naval Ice Center. And again, I'm the Deputy Director there, and I work for NOAA. Um, let's go ahead and get this going. Okay. All right, there we go. So this is our second slide, high, loot, high latitude domain awareness. This is pretty much, I think, what you said, bread and butter. This is my bread and butter slide. This is the mission. This is the U.S. NIC's mission right here. I'm not going to read it to you, but a few things I'm going to do point out is the U.S. NIC is the only ice service with a global area of responsibility, and we also do snow, snow tracking, snow monitoring, and that, that snow information does go up into the numerical weather prediction models. Um, so if we start at the top left, so pretty much what we do. So how do we, how do, we do high latitude domain awareness? So pretty much we get our hands on data. We love data. I'm a meteorologist as well. So any type of data we can get in-house and utilize, that's what we're going to do. Whether it's remote sensing data, whether it's in situ. Um, we spoke about SAR. Uh, I think when I was an analyst there four, five, six years ago, um, we were trying to get our hands on as much SAR as possible. Nowadays, that's not too much of a big issue, especially with RCM launching and whatnot. There's going to be data uh, available for us. It's how quick we get that data, how we process it, how we manipulate it, and how we get that information out to the users. That's that's what we're that's the brain, that's the train of thought right now. What's going on? And how we're going to handle that data and use the data and get the data out the door. So, anyways, we, we bring in the information, we port it into our IT systems, we uh, manipulate it, we analyze that data, then we get it out to the users. That's pretty much what we do. Um, there's some illustrations of products speckled on the uh, slide here. If you start in the top left, it's a tailored graphic of our weekly sea ice concentration analysis. It's about two weeks ago. Um, this is the northern hemisphere. We also do the southern hemisphere, and we do this weekly. Dropping down, it's a bi-weekly annotated image of the Northwest Passage. It's created every two weeks from approximately July through October. Um, sliding to the right, the northern hemisphere snow and ice charting. Uh, Graphic that you see there, that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the Nick Snow and Ice charts. That information does go into the numerical weather prediction models, um, not only by NOAA, but other uh, uh, numerical weather prediction folks across the globe. Sliding to the right again, trivariate climatology of the Northwest Passage, showing open water, marginal ice zone, and pack ice. And then we have an annotated imagery. Uh, we do annotated imagery products, so we have our, 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 our tracking, our ice concentration products, but then also we do annotated imagery, special support products. But this 
Uh, unattended imagery product is for the U.S. Coast Guard Maple during her 2017 Northwest Passage Transit. And then finally on the top right is our weekly D17 slide showing ice concentrations and estimated thickness. All righty. The U.S. National Ice Center is, is distinct, distinctly recognized in both the Department of Defense Arctic Strategy and the Navy Strategic Outlook for the Arctic, both for our expertise and support to operations and our co-management of the interagency and international Arctic buoy programs. We look forward to the updated NOAA Arctic Action Plan, and we directly support the U.S. Coast Guard Arctic strategy through daily support and deployments. All right, so this is probably my favorite slide again. I mentioned it, increasing demand year-round. So every year, uh, the Ice Center, um, we have an executive steering committee with, uh, we're a tri-agency organization. We have Coast Guard folks there, we have Navy folks, and we have NOAA folks, and we, we give a little presentation on um, yeah, yeah, of course, fiscal concerns, but the mission as a whole and how we're changing any challenges and kind of where we need to get to for the next year. And this past year, we decided, you know, to take a look at our, our operations. And, you know, there's a lot of strain on staff right now. Existing resources are there trying to get the job done uh, and get the data out the door. So we put together this in-house uh, chart, and it really depicts uh, – yeah, the increasing demand year-round, and that's a good presentation, a representation of what's going on on our operations floor right now. So overall production has increased 21% on average over the last two years. This includes routine support as well as special support at every classification level. We do this in a fiscally constrained environment without being fully staffed. And I think one, one of my takeaways is the special support. Um, we, need, we, we are continually looking at our special support program, and it needs revamped. Um, to handle the amounts of support requests coming in, the type of support requests coming in, and really a lot of the, a lot of the information over the last year or two, it's really demands on tactical scale support for, for mariners out at sea. And that type of support, that's, that's really starting to become a lot of the, the work we do on the operations floor, getting that information out to the user, making sure it gets through those limited comm pipes, making sure we're getting that information they need to be successful uh, out to them. That's really the, uh, the increasing demand signal that I'm seeing. As overall production increases in quantity, so does the number and variety of government entities that need support. The U.S. National Ice Center is able to keep up with the increase in requests and production without addition, additional resources by having to get creative, automate what makes sense, look for ways to use the advancements in machine learning, find efficiencies in data management and operational workflow processes, rely on advances in ice modeling, and integrate them into operations. Work with NOAA STAR and others to create new satellite-derived products and, as always, leverage our partnerships as force multipliers. Incorporating these things is how we will keep pace with the demands of an ice-diminishing Arctic. We do this together with our partners in the North American Ice Service. And that's, that's my wrap-up for slides. Back over to Kristen. All right. And so uh, we'll, we'll have one last slide here, and this is on our North American Ice Service Evolving Partnership. We started out um, from a joint working, uh, the Joint Ice Working Group back in the uh, mid 80s. And then uh, in 2003, NACE was officially formed as the three core members IIP, the N Canadian Ice Service, and the US National Ice Center. Um, in 20, but is it, it is an evolving partnership as we expand operations in the Arctic as that demand signal increases. So in 2016, Danish Meteorological Institute. Uh, joined NACE as an observer, and last year in 2018, National Weather Service Alaska region joined NACE as a participant. So we are more than just a group of analysts creating a, a suite of products. We really look to enhance collaboration, improve standardization, uh, uh, collaborate on science opportunities, and advance ice and iceberg science. Uh, and as we move into uh, expanded operations in the Arctic, uh, looking at where our, our services fit in and make sure that our products and our services are meeting the needs of those operating in that area. And with that, I'll take, I see everybody's a little bit fearful of the microphone. Oh, here we go. Yes. One question. All right. So, like, I'll ask one question. Um, I've recently started doing a lot of research on the Arctic and things that are happening up there. One of the resources that I found interesting and valuable to me to, at this point was marine traffic. Uh, which is a which is a commercial website, which helped me learn about a DOT sponsored website called Sea Vision, and it occurred to me as I was looking at your presentation that it would be great to know where the icebergs are too, 
because as there is more global warming, those things will probably undoubtedly happen at higher latitudes and be more dangerous potentially. And so are you considering you know, incorporating all that data that you're collecting, which is great because we need AI, but are you, are, you, are you looking for ways like that to collaborate? Um, absolutely, and, I, and I'll look at actually, um, Scott mentioned the International Ice Charting Work Group, which all three of us are also members of, and that organization has a task team specifically, to, two task teams that are working together. One is looking at mariner needs for ice services. Are we getting, are there, is our information uh, the right information, and um, are we getting them to in a, ma in a manner in which they can use it, and what do they want? So we have one task team looking at that, and the other task team is looking at um, how do we put this information into an electronic format. A lot of our, our data is designed for when mariners charted on paper charts, and, and my background is as a cutterman, and, and we don't use paper charts anymore, except to like wrap gifts, because people really like them when you wrap gifts in them. <laughs> But uh, uh, it's, it's all electronic. So that is definitely something that we are looking at. But again, we, are, we look at a cross that is a, 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 a standardization across. So we don't want to make, we want to make sure that the product that we're putting out there is not providing incorrect information on someone's electronic charting system. So those are all so, uh, uh, resources that we are looking at um, in coordination as, as all of our services look to modernize uh, uh, both how we uh, execute the mission, the, the information, the, the data services that we pull from, but also the products that we, we put out for, uh, for our customers. Thank you. Do you guys yeah. have anything? I'll ask you. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I think we're getting the hook from Mike for that. So thank you all for your attention yes, today. Thanks. Th thank you very much. I'm going to be known as like Hook Mike or something like that. I, I, I just really don't mean to be that abrupt about it. Thank you so very much for that presentation and for the leadership there. Uh, as we transition to the next panel, which I will uh, introduce and, and moderate, uh, I just wanted to once again underscore uh, the, the panel before last. Uh, in particular, Hugh. Hugh, are you here? Hugh, would you just stand up one more time? Hugh, thank you uh, for... All, all of the presentations were palpable, but over and over, every time you speak to us in this town, you bring Alaska and the commu all Alaskan communities to us in such a way that is far more vivid than anyone else can explain. I mean, the video is fantastic, but to me it represents all of the communities in Alaska, not just Wainwright. So I want to thank you for that and also for the support of Laguna Corporation. I mean, without your real support, your investment in the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center. I am not standing here. We are not having these kind of meetings. So my friend, thank you very much for what you do for us and for the investments that you put in us. Thank you. Our next panel, uh, which I, by my script, I'm both introducing and moderating, so this ought to be fun, uh, is based uh, on a discussion that happened a while ago here at the Wilson Center and then again in Tromso on Arctic Ocean and the Blue Ocean Economy. So if our panelists would come out, uh, I'll just move over to the, the panel here. But we have often heard the, co the concept of a blue ocean economy, and so we've asked our Norwegian colleagues to come and talk with us a little bit about what that might look like, how we could advance that, not just from a Norwegian perspective, but an international perspective. So I think my, yes, it's still on, okay. Here, we're gonna move this. So I've asked each of my colleagues here to do a self-introduction and um, explain just a short brief title and, and a little bit of background, and then we'll come back around to a few minute presentations each, and then we'll have a discussion here, and if time allows, and since I'm the timekeeper, we'll try to keep it fairly reasonable, uh, we'll, we'll have a, a Q and A uh, if time allows. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, the blue economy uh, is something uh, that we already are practicing in the Arctic. Uh, a very good example of that is uh, the management of uh, living marine uh, resources. Uh, the fisheries in the Arctic contribute something like uh, six to eight 
million tons annually to the global food supply. And those fisheries are by and large managed in a sustainable way. Uh, and uh, a critical aspect of that sustainable management is uh, the contribution of, uh, of science. It's a critical element for sustainability. And uh, in uh, the Northeast Atlantic uh, region, uh, where we come from, the International Council for the Exploration of uh, the Sea, ICES, is uh, the body uh, providing the scientific advice and coordinating the science uh, that goes into uh, the management of, um, of the living marine resources in that, uh, that region. Now, interest in Arctic science is growing, um, and in addition to uh, ICES and its uh, North Pacific uh, sister organization, uh, PISES, there are now a growing number of uh, initiatives. Um, uh, we have the Arctic Council uh, Agreement on International Scientific Cooperation in the Arctic. Uh, just entered into force. Uh, there are the uh, activities relating to science in Arctic Council working groups. Uh, there are the Arctic uh, science ministerials, the first one taking place here in DC in uh, 2016. Uh, the next one in Japan next year. Uh, we do have uh, the uh, future scientific committee in the agreement to prevent unregulated fishing in the high seas in the Arctic. Uh, that was presented earlier today by uh, Professor Harrison. Uh, so the point being, there are a number of new initiatives out there, and I think it is important that we have a conversation about how to align those initiatives, uh, ensure that I all contribute to, um, to uh, the blue economy. And in addition to that, uh, we also have to take into account that there are global initiatives underway, in particular the UN decade on ocean science, marine science, and, um, and that is going to be an important uh, global uh, factor in how we develop uh, science further in, uh, in the Arctic. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I'm, my name is Ole Övertreit, and I'm the director of the Arctic Frontiers uh, in uh, Tromsø. Uh, and I'd just like to, to use a minute to tell uh, explain how we work uh, in, in the Arctic frontiers. Together with partners and friends like the Wilson Center, uh, we are aiming to set the agenda for a sustainable and knowledge-based uh, development of the Arctic. We bring people together across so sectors and uh, bo uh, borders. Um, and working on the Arctic in a broader sense, uh, we have boxed uh, uh, the way uh, our, our topics into four main areas, the ocean society, business and, uh, and the link between science and uh, uh, policy. And uh, our main conference is in January and we're, um, uh, like uh, Sullivan, uh, Senator Sullivan said earlier today, the importance to bring people to the Arctic, to see the Arctic, is something that we are striving at and we are very happy to do that one week uh, a year uh, in January where we have some 3,000 delegates from 30, 40 countries. Uh, we also have approximately 30 conferences and events throughout the year. And uh, in May, we were very happy to, uh, to have uh, a visit from five uh, American senators, among those uh, Senator Murkowski and White House. Um, I'd like to, to go over to say a few words about how we are working uh, on the ocean. We have had this as a special focus uh, in our conferences the last three, four years. Um, the global economy is growing. Uh, the OECD has estimating a doubling in the ocean econ economy between 2010 and 2030. 
And the Arctic, of course, is a large portion, a large part of the, the ocean, and uh, a special part, it's a diverse part, and it's a natural resource-rich uh, part of, 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 uh, of uh, the, the ocean. Uh, there are four million people living in the Arctic, to a large extent by the coasts and of, of resources from uh, the ocean. And as the ocean economy grow, this should and must contribute also to a strong and resilient uh, building of Arctic societies. And in my view, Arctic communities and societies had, has had too little focus in the broader Arctic uh, global uh, discourse. And uh, I was very happy to hear Dan Solven pointing to uh, that the people need to be uh, in the center. Uh, and people and societies is one of the four focus areas in the Iceland strategy for their Arctic uh, Council chairmanship term. And uh, I think it's a very important statement from Iceland and a statement that I'm looking forward to also see the results of during the next, next couple of years. The Arctic Council has also been signing uh, an MOU with the Arctic Economic Council and will be collabor collaborating closer. I think this is also very positive. Business must be part of the uh, solution. Um, and a changing uh, Arctic gives new opportunities, not least in the blue economy with energy, both green and uh, not so green. Seafood uh, with wild catch uh, and uh, ocean farming. Shipping, we have been discussing that uh, earlier today. Minerals, and here I like to, to, to highlight the potential in subsea mining, which is the, uh, might be quite uh, substantial. And of course, tourism. A lot of Arctic regions have uh, really benefited from uh, the growth in, in tourism. Now, these prospects, they bring optimism. But they also bring uh, concern that the growth in the blue economy will have most effects outside of the Arctic, that surplus and workplaces will fly out of the region. Uh, we must make sure that the blue growth in the Arctic brings good jobs, safe jobs, interesting jobs, investments uh, in, in, the, in the region that builds uh, society and resilience. Of course, there are a few challenges attached to industrial uh, development happening in our northern oceans, a lack of interest, infrastructure, uh, communication is far from perfect, both uh, onshore and offshore, and uh, uh, there's uh, challenges attached to search and um, uh, rescue. And of course, development must be sustainable, and as, as Alf Okund, uh, pointed to, must be based on science and the best possible knowledge. Um, most importantly, scientific knowledge as uh, foundation for management, business, and uh, development. And uh, just as my, my final remarks, I'd just like to mention that Arctic Frontiers has been focusing on these uh, issues, bringing science and policy and business together for 15 years. Uh, our next conference will be in uh, January 2020, and the title is, will be Power of Knowledge. We're also very happy to be collaborating with another uh, American institution, Tufts University, and their Science Diplomacy Center on a book series on knowledge-based development of the Arctic. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to address you. My name is Liv Monika Stubholt. I'm a business lawyer practicing in Oslo, Norway. And uh, on behalf of a client, uh, Kverne, that is an offshore yard contractor, I'm also tasked to head the non-executive board of the Norwegian-Russian Chamber of Commerce. And finally, uh, in January, I was asked to join the board of World Ocean Council, which is an industry association organizing businesses that support sustainable ocean business activities. So I have a few points I would like to share with you under the headline of Blue Economy, and thank you, Mike, for putting Blue Economy, Blue Growth on the agenda. I've noticed uh, that Mike is a very good thanker, and I'm, I've been taking notes, so I think I wanted to really return the compliment. Um, uh, you've really did, done a fabulous job, you and the Woodrow Wilson Center and uh, the Polar Center for uh, putting together the agenda. Because I would, uh, state that business is not only a 
an engine for growth, but it actually touches upon both the science and the security aspects of the Arctic. And let me uh, explain what I mean by that. If you are going to um, if it, it take into consideration security aspects, one of the key ways to do that is to make sure that there is settlement, that there is employment, and that there is activity in the areas in the Arctic. And that will not happen if you don't have business that creates job and employment and growth. So by supporting business, you're also taking care of security considerations in an indirect but very powerful way. And secondly, in terms of science, it is true that science is very much dependent on gathering data and the Arctic is vast and businesses in the Arctic could to a higher degree than today be mobilized into collaborating with uh, science players. One could uh, equip and um, build a full research vessel and that will do very valuable work. But if you were able to uh, mount sensors for measuring temperatures and other aspects of the ocean on the thousands of commercial vessels that you will find in the world oceans and also in the Arctic, then you would have a new and very much today unexplored source of data. World Ocean Council uh, is very much prepared to work with the science community to allow for science monitoring, science sensors and science related activities to be part also of business, transportation and maritime. And in terms of looking at how the region, the, the Arctic region works, it's been said earlier there are many uh, Arctics, which is true because the infrastructure has different level of um, development around in the Arctic. But there are some similarities in the Arctic. And for business, the key issue is really predictability in terms of uh, the um, legislation, in terms of uh, the rules-based system. And that will be really my closing point in my introduction. It's the following. One of the myths that we need to debunk with regard to the Arctic is that it is lawless territory and a race for the Arctic uh, where the, uh, the biggest bully will win. Well, firstly, in my experience working with business players, there is no race for the Arctic from a business point of view. There's rather a need to encourage and facilitate business to uh, be taken interest in the Arctic. Secondly, the thing that will trigger, promote and facilitate business activities, which everybody will welcome, uh, will be to um, honor and to give credit to those uh, players in business that su support sustainability, that will work with both local communities, uh, indigenous peoples and the authorities to make sure that sustainability principles are upheld and also to reinforce the fact that we have basically the structure from a legal point of view in the Arctic that we need. We have UNCLOS, which covers the Arctic as the Arctic is an ocean. We have the domestic legislation that will apply fully and equally to every part of the uh, coastal states of the Arctic Ocean in the Arctic uh, sphere. And I think it's important to demystify the Arctic from a legal and a business point of view. I won't say business as usual, but it can be exactly uh, on the same terms for the players in business that are prepared to honor sustainability. And that can often be made visible and clear by businesses, as many of the clients I work with, embracing principles that communicate sustainability as a business principle. One exa such example is the principles for sustainable investment in the Arctic that was developed by the World Economic Forum uh, Working Group and is presently being um, uh, implemented by Arctic Economic Council, which is the business association set up to welcome and uh, reciprocate the invitation to business from Arctic Council. So best practice uh, investment principles is one way for business we have found to communicate both to its own organization and to other stakeholders 
that we are worthy recipients of the support to work in the Arctic. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So I, I just want to make <clears throat> one uh, housekeeping uh, note. Since we're off about 15 minutes, I'd like to move our lunch time from 12.15 to 1.15, so we, we get a solid hour in there. I think everybody needs that, so we have a few more minutes. And instead of me asking the questions that I really wanted to ask, I'd like to flip it and see if there are questions from the audience. Use the time that I was going to use on this issue of blue ocean economy, I think, writ large, right? The, the larger concepts uh, that would be, uh, I take your cue, Church, that you have a question? Yeah, I do. Thank you. Thank you, General. Uh, doctor. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to the panel for some great insights. Uh, my name is Churchkey. I'm the uh, director of the Center of Arctic Research sponsored by Department of Homeland Security. That's hosted by the University of Alaska. We just hosted a, uh, conducted a kind of innovative workshop uh, in uh, Utiavik uh, a couple weeks ago, trying to think about in a rural Arctic Alaska uh, perspective about how we'd incorporate blue economy into a region that historically doesn't have an awful lot of really robust economic development. Uh, one of the questions we came from this is the fact that uh, when you look at different approaches to blue economy, how much have you been able to look at blue economy from your respective vantage points uh, in a rural context or developing blue economy in a, in a rural Arctic vantage point on the perhaps uh, the eastern side of the Arctic as opposed to the western side of the Arctic. Some reflections, I'd be grateful for whatever you could offer. Thank you. Well, I can kick off with a quick um, thought. Uh, in terms of the seafood industry that I've had the pleasure to work with, it is, of course, a considerable impact also on land-based business in terms of the fact that the seafood industry is presently globally a mega trend in terms of marine-based proteins, and that means that the, the demand is growing and the value chain is getting longer. Before you'd had, uh, originally people would have uh, individual portion fish, you'd get the whole fish on your plate. That doesn't happen today. You will get processed food, processed products, and more than anything that was mentioned from the podium earlier, the importance of other protein-based products based on marine proteins such as fish meal and a fish um, oil, which will be uh, part of a whole range of quite sophisticated products. So to look at the seafood industry, both wild catch and aquaculture, and to look at how to expand the value chain is something which has worked very well, not only for Norway, but many other other countries that have focused on how to make marine proteins a valuable commodity for the country. Please. Uh, so if I could follow up a bit on, on that, um, uh, the figures I was uh, referring to uh, were related to capture fisheries, uh, six to eight million tons uh, per year from uh, the Arctic and the subarctic. Uh, what is an important development now is that aquaculture is growing in importance in, in the Arctic. Um, in uh, the northern part of, uh, of Norway, which is subarctic, uh, it's about half a million ton of uh, Atlantic salmon produced uh, every year. That is growing and uh, it's also taking off in other Arctic countries uh, as well. So this is a very important development for the Arctic as a food producing region, the, the, uh, the, grow, the growth in aquaculture. Well, I was going to ask you, uh, but, but Church's question as well is, there is a stream here between Norway and Alaska, right? We, I mean, there is a, there's a relationship that goes on at the very practical level, scientific level, legislative level, uh, and the merging of having uh, Arctic frontiers here uh, and our Norwegian colleagues and many Alaskans here, I think there's something to be learned to continue to pull the thread on Church's question, which is what can we learn from each other and how can we institutionalize that learning? And it just doesn't have to be between Alaska and Norway, but amongst the whole auditorium here. And so that's where I'm getting at, Church. I think that there's institutionally, whether it's through the Alaska-Nor agreement or through our relationship with yeah. Arctic Frontiers, and I could name others, 
that the, we can find some of these things, I believe, like the blue ocean economy and all of its variations and do the best practices, but actually don't write about it, actually do it, implement it, learn from each other. And this might be the perfect one with your efforts in Alaska and what we already know coming from Norway as well. Yeah, just to comment on that, I think that um, what we're seeing now is, uh, in these times we see like, uh, um, that the processes that have been going on to make networks, platforms, arenas like Arctic Frontiers and like the Arctic Circle, like this, to get people to, to come together and to make yeah. networks, really are, are coming to uh, 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 results now. So we're seeing that uh, there are um, uh, links between uh, Norway, Northern Norway, and Alaska. We see the same thing between. Northern Norway and uh, Eastern Canada, and there's a large ocean cluster there working with Norwegian actors. Uh, and uh, we have uh, opening up channels to, uh, between Norway and uh, Greenland and Iceland and to a larger degree. So in, in my, it's my impression that, that the, the sort of uh, this, the, the results are being, are being ready to be in, uh, put into action uh, in these times. Another question. Ray, please. Hi, Ray Arnado, American Polar Society. Um, question for the last speaker, just really um, elaboration, I think, um, when you mentioned the, the myth of the race to the, to the poles uh, for resources. I mean, where does that come from? Because I hear it all the time, and I always remind people that the organization's pretty good, the boundaries are fixed, we all know that, but so we just, do we blame the press on this? Or, so first question is, where does it come from? Who's making this false accusation? Um, I think our Russian colleague, Mr. Gorsky, spoke to the same point about you know, Russia being institutional threat. Um, and secondly, well, what can we do about it other than you know, people like you speaking to us, the convinced, uh, that uh, it's, you know, we know the problem, let's move on, but you know, should we be attacking uh, those with uh, bad information or take our, take our lumps and drive on? But anyway, just your thoughts. So I think it's a very good question because to be able to debunk a myth, you'll have to understand where it comes from. So it's a very valid question. So let me give you an example as a way of responding. And some of you will remember uh, around 2007, late 2007, there was a big brouhaha in international media about how uh, the Russian Federation had placed an aluminum Russian flag on the North Pole on the seabed. And um, that was considered to be part of the race for the Arctic. And um, it was uh, portrayed as Russia really uh, pipping everybody at the post and making um, invalid claims. The reality of that expedition that took place with a submarine and a well-known Arctic explorer who happens also to be um, a parliamentarian in Russia was that they were in the process of collecting data for their scientific submission to the International Continental Shelf Commission in New York. So they were abiding by an international treaty, um, and at the same time, they had an interest in promoting this domestically as a way of showing that the Russian Federation is a strong country. So they were actually doing what we want countries to do, abiding uh, by international treaties and uh, submitting the information they're being asked for. But at the same time, it was an internal um, communication platform, which was picked up, but not the underlying fact of the mission. So sometimes Russia has an interest in uh, creating the impression that somebody is uh, always losing when you're winning. And other times, it is the other way around, that somebody in the US is interested in portraying Russia as a bigger enemy than it is. So I think it's fair to say that media and authorities, governments, should think twice before they um, decide to use a tabloid version of the truth to serve short-term goals. Uh, and thereby maybe risking the long-term interest in global balance and harmony. Thank you. And, and I would add, Ray, just my, my two cents on this, that when Chilangarov did that, when he laid the flag down, uh, yes, it was the race to the, for resources, and, and now we see it again revised with China, and, and it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice tagline, and some like to play into it. 
But I would, I'd argue the other way around, that what happened, in my opinion, and a number of other things, is that when Chilangarov did that, it actually spurred a lot of interest in the Arctic, which many people wanted to have. So there is also this, I think, some positive to that. Right? I mean, it was played one way, but it also was sort of like a reverse Sputnik, uh, that it, it, it spurred your eyes to think about the North. I talked to people who had never thought about who could claim the North Pole. But ever since then, they've had an interest in the Arctic. So there's the other way around. But I think, I think it's, you know, there's, there's many drivers and forces between pushing different agendas, as you know far better than I do. Willie, do you want to say something on that? And yeah, I'm also just, careful of the time, I, I, too. A, a so, quick well. uh, comment, uh, because I think there's also an element of uh, uh, the Arctic being perceived as a terra nulla a place where nobody lives, and, uh, and this echoes also Senator Sullivan's uh, uh, reference to his four-star general that there are no people here. So it's a very exotic place where these kind of battles can take place, which is, uh, I think, and, and it's an easy setup, an easy story to tell for the media that this is this place where there are these battles going on, but it's really not. We have time for maybe just one other quick one or else we'll, we'll go to lunch. I have a feeling I know where we're going with that one. Okay, would you please thank these wonderful panelists for bringing up this issue of the Blue Ocean Economy. Uh, we will start again at 1.15. My apologies to those who are gonna present earlier, but we'll just shift everything by about 15 minutes and we'll do far more on the Blue Ocean Economy in the time that we have remaining this afternoon. And you'll see why. Thank you so much.